I would like to recommend to you to read a book along with this presentation. It's a $15 book. It's any bookstore. It's by Zondervan. In my opinion, it's probably the best text on special hermeneutics. I'm primarily dealing with general hermeneutics, but, uh, and it's written by my favorite charismatic author, which is the most, one of the most balanced authors I know. It's called How to Read the Bible for All It is Worth. How to Read the Bible for All It is Worth by Garden Fee, F-E-E, -E, and Doug Stewart. S-T-U-A-R-T. -T. I think it'll be a blessing to you. You'll see it many, many places in my notes. And uh, Now, it seems a little disjointed to me because um, I'm kind of going as long as the time allows me and kind of cutting off where I can. So um, you may feel like I haven't um, made a, tr a smooth transition to this topic, but the truth is I'm still caught in last presentation's topic. So I'm on page uh, 13, and I'm dealing with the... Uh, Roman numeral four, the basic purposes of the Bible. Uh, the last time I dealt with A, and just to remind you, I, I am committed to the Bible primarily as finding a guide. The guidelines are important, but the major gift is the guide himself. And um, I, I'm, I'm committed to that. Now, if you'll notice, I'm picking up on some other things that the Bible is not. It is not a rule book. And number two, it is not a science book. Uh, I really hope that if you have uh, children that are in science or going to a secular university that you will take special note of what I'm going to say for the next few minutes because I believe there has been an engendered war between science and faith. Would you please look at me? I am not at war with science. I have become quite content to let science discover the when and the how of the physical creation. But without the revelation of the Bible, there is no who or why. To know how and when without an understanding of God is the most depressing understanding that I can imagine because if you only know science as a species, we are doomed. There is no hope in a violent universe like ours for life on this planet. It is just a matter of time. Even the universe itself, what we think right now, is going to expand and expand until it goes cold. There is no hope in physicalness. And yet the world is attracted to it because it gives us all the gadgets and experimentally answers some of the uh, questions that we seek. But I say this to you. Even if we talk about a big bang... It still doesn't talk about who pulled the trigger. It still doesn't talk about the purpose. Now, I do not believe that, that the Bible is anti-scientific. I believe it is pre-scientific. It was in a Christian worldview that scientific method developed. It is in great Christians that early science began. There is no way for modern science to have begun in the cyclical philosophies of Eastern religions. It is in the West that believes that God has, has set guidelines and principles and laws into creation that make it a regular and observable uh, kind of presentation to the human five senses. I would say to you that the Bible predates science. Um, the Bible was not written to answer scientific questions coming out of the 17th, 18th, 19th, 20th centuries. And so to make an ancient book answer questions it was never designed to make and then taking it from ancient Hebrew thought and demanding it be literal Western history does terrible things to the Bible. I would say that the Bible is written in what I call phenomenological language. It is written in the language of five senses. It is written as if a human observer was standing observing what is happening. Now... Many people do crazy things with the Bible and think they have somehow defeated Revelation. They, I've heard stuff like this. Well, the Bible says that there's a three-story three universe and we know that's not true, so the Bible must be false. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. The three-story universe is a way of talking about God and creation. It is not meant to be the last word in this. And by the way, 
Well, just an example of that three-storied universe. People say, well, the Bible says the dead are in the center of the earth, and we know that's not true, so the Bible's false. Wait a minute, wait a minute now. I heard about a story of the deepest oil well ever drilled was in China, and someone, God knows why, put a microphone down the pipe. And they said, we heard people screaming, and now we know. That was magma burping. Christians, like ancient Jews, like many people in the world, but not all people, bury their dead. In India, they burn their dead. In the Americas, they put their dead on platforms to, to just disintegrate. In places in the Middle East, they put them in towers for the birds to eat and the bones to fall in a collective middle. We happen to bury our dead. So if you ask, where are the dead? They're in the ground. But that was never meant to be developed as a literal thing of people living in the center of the earth. The Bible, another one. The, earth, the Bible says the earth floats on water, so there's the Bible's not true. Wait a minute, wait a minute. You go down to Galveston, you dig a hole in the sand, water fills it up. You go into to West Texas, many oil wells hit salt water. The ancients were desert people. They knew that in the middle of a desert were these beautiful springs and, and date palms. Where did that come from? There was water down there. They, they said, as the language of description, not the language of science, the language of description, the earth floats on water. Now, to take the Bible ultimately literal as a way to discount its authority is typical of Western thinkers who do not know Eastern literature. We in America speak the same way and, and we claim to be a technological culture. And when you got up this morning and rolled over into that special person in your life and said, oh, what a beautiful sunrise. Now, wouldn't it be just squirrely to wake up and say, oh, honey, look at this earth rotation. <laughs> I guarantee the sun did not rise this morning. Or we say, oh, the dew fell last night. Friends, dew does not fall. There's a condensation layer, a temperature variant, moisture content close to the earth. We speak in the language of description every day and then condemn the Bible for doing the same. I went to India several years ago, got off the planes. The Indian pastor was there. I said, I am tickled to death to be here. And he said, I'm so sorry. <laughs> we speak in these metaphors. Oh, that's awfully good. What? I'm all ears. Well, get me a giant Q-tip. I mean, what? Well, come on! We speak in metaphors and demand a different kind of thing for the Bible. It's crazy to me. So let me go through this if I could. The Bible is pre-scientific, not anti-scientific. It is a world view. God did it, not a world picture. How God did it. It is written in the language of description, the five senses, phenomenological language. Now, there's some great books down here under number four. If you have a young person going into the sciences or even a, even a theological uh, area, this little book, number C, 4C, The Christian View of Science and Scripture by Bernard Ram has been a wonderful book in my life. Uh, he has a Ph.D. in the philosophy of science and a Ph.D. in theology. He is able to bridge that gap in a time where few others would, could, or tried. Um, he freed me to begin to think in terms, in terms beyond the literalism that I was given by sincere people who love the Bible. Deliver me from dogmatic preachers and dogmatic scientists. They both give me a rash. This book, number E, Darwinism on Trials, written by a lawyer, but give it a break. Uh, this guy has done some of the most exciting work on the flaws in naturalism. I am not against evolution. I'm smart enough to know that animals change over time to certain changing situations in their environment. I happen to know that all horses came from an ancient little horse. All dogs came from an ancient wild dog. There's nothing strange about that. Just look at the fossil record. What I cannot live with is naturalism, which makes it just chance, luck, fate. You just look at one, one human cell and the sequential need for chemical reaction goes into the hundreds that have to be sequential in their order. This cannot be a random fact. This is why so many are drawn to intelligent design as a way to look at our world. 
We can't document that as far as uh, do experiments on it, but when the more we look into the intricacies of a cell, the more we see that it was not known in Darwin's day, the more we see how planned and structured this physical universe is. The last one's Reason to Believe by Hugh Ross. This is a PhD in, a, in astronomy. Uh, this is the man that's convinced me of an old earth. Heresy! Before I'm a heretic, why don't you read some? Just because you never heard it doesn't mean I'm weird. Have you done any personal study in this area or you're just telling me what someone told you that you trusted from the last century? Have you read anything? We get so dogmatic on our Bible interpretation principles and forget that we're in a type of literature in Genesis 1 that is never meant to be the same kind of history as historical narratives in the rest of the Old Testament. If you're going to summarize how God did everything quickly, how do you do it? Well, the author of Genesis, which I do not think is Moses. Now, before you throw up, give me a minute. There are no Egyptian words or concepts until Joseph. Now, Joseph is way down in the book of Genesis. All of the models, all of the parallels to the creation account in the Bible are Mesopotamian, Babylonian, the Gilgamesh epic. Now, that all comes from the, around Ur of the Chaldees where Abraham was called from. I think that Moses, writing in 14-something, used oral traditions from the patriarchs dating back to much closer to the time of the events. None of the Egyptian cosmology is in the Bible. It's all Babylonian. And of course, those of us who believe the Bible is true believe the Bible's concept predates the Babylonian one. But, simply to say, I think there is evidence for an old earth. I personally am advocate of what's called progressive creationism, which makes the earth 3.7, 4.7 billion years old and makes the Garden of Eden a more recent creation, isolated from the rest of nature. Now, you can critique that, but it's an attempt by me to take the Bible seriously and not just um, a disregard all of the experimental data that's coming into us in our age. I hope you'll read Reasons to Believe. I think it will uh, open your eyes to many areas that maybe you haven't thought about. Number C, I do not believe the Bible is a magic book. Now, I was at a conference all week. I'm on the board of directors for an evangelistic group. They had their annual meeting where they brought their people from around the world in. I got to teach Ephesians. I love that. One of the men, when I was leaving, said, yes, and I was seeking God's will for my life, whether I ought to do this, and I just opened the Bible up and God revealed it to me. I do believe that God deals in mercy with new Christians. I do believe when we're new Christians, God will bend over backwards to communicate to us in ways that really are more magical. But friends, once we become mature Christians, letting the Bible flop over is not one of them. It always flops over where I spilled coffee in the Psalms. Now, if I, if I want to know who I'm supposed to marry, I'm just, how do I find Peggy in this? Should I go to Lakeside? And Jesus walked by the sea. That's it, that's it. That's a bunch of bull. That is treating the Bible like a crystal ball instead of like a revelation from God. That is more like a Ouija board than Christian. That is superstitious baloney. And yet God's people do it all the time. Secondly, like a magical charm. I want to give you a test. I want you to put any translation of the Bible on your dashboard, and I want you to speed through a radar trap and tell me what happens. <laughs> this is not magical. This is dead cow, dead trees, and soot. There's nothing holy about this. It's the author that's holy. It's the message that's holy. Its presence is not the key. Its message is the key, and it must be read. Its physical presence is not magical. Finally, it's not a fetish. I try to do this humorously really when I can, but I hope I don't gross you out. I don't want to. But, uh, well, I guess I do or I wouldn't do it. But 
You, why do we take the Bible with us when we go to the hospital? You're paying more for that hospital room than you are for the best cruise in the world. Why do you take this? Because for us, as evangelicals, this is a symbol of the presence of God. There is a Bible in that room, a Gideon's New Testament, or a full Bible. If you want to read the Bible, you've got a Bible. But you're not going to read. You're sick as a dog. You wouldn't be paying that much for a room. Now, you can put this Bible over the incision, and it'll probably infect it. You can take John 3.16 and eat it, and you will probably be constipated for days. This is not magic. This is not magic. It is a message. It must be read. Its physical presence is not enough. On page 14, I'd like to summarize the, uh, these presuppositions because I think all of us have them. All of us have them, but we very seldom analyze them. I believe the Bible, both Old and New Testaments, is the only clear self-revelation of God. I uh, had an Australian theologian look at my website to recommend it to theologians without borders, and he wrote back and said, I can't believe this guy said that the Bible is the only clear self-revelation of God. What about Jesus and the Holy Spirit? I wish I was in Australia. Would you please tell me how I know it's the presence of the Holy Spirit? If the table floats or I get goosebumps, the Spirit told me, is that a clear revelation? If we get ten people and they all get different messages, quote from the Spirit, which one do we say is objective and true? And please tell me, I believe Jesus is the ultimate revelation of God. There is no question the living word is superior to the written word. There is no question that we only have a limited amount of the written word. But would you please tell me how I know anything about Jesus apart from Scripture? I didn't live in the first century. He didn't walk in my bedroom and discuss theology with me. How do I know anything about him, what he said, what he did, and who he is if it does not come from Scripture? Please tell me. The New Testament is the perfect fulfillment and interpreter of the Old Testament. I believe in one and only one eternal creator-redeemer God initiated the writings of our canonical scriptures by inspiring certain chosen persons to record and explain his acts in the lives of individuals and nations. The Bible is our only clear source of information about God and his purposes. Natural revelation, I've given you the text there, is valid but not complete. Jesus Christ is the capstone of God's revelation about himself. I've given you the text. The Bible must be illumined by the Holy Spirit in order to be correctly understood. Its message, now look at these. How many adjectives do I have to use to be a conservative? Please tell me how many I have to use authoritative, adequate, eternal, infallible, and trustworthy for all believers. And yet there is a group of people who say, since you didn't use inerrant, you're a liberal. Does the Bible use the word inerrant? Is that a biblical word? So now I've got to use a non-biblical word and define it the way you feel comfortable for me to be a conservative? By their fruits ye shall know them. You watch how I handle the scriptures and how people who say a whole lot about the Bible and then give you their opinion, allegorize it. You tell me where the authority is. I'm smart enough to know that if I let some fool on TV say the Bible's inerrant and he finds one manuscript problem, one number problem, one seeming paradox, he can throw the whole thing out because if it's inerrant, one error disqualifies it. But if it's infallible and trustworthy and it has a literary nature, then some of these things can be explained. Otherwise, we're in big trouble. And by the way, if you believe that God gave an inerrant Bible, did the Holy Spirit fumble the ball in making copies of it? Because we don't have one today. The exact mode of its inspiration has not been revealed to us, but it is obvious to believers that the Bible is a supernatural book written by natural men under special leadership. Now next in my notes, Roman numeral 6, are the two sermons that I did for you the first few days I was here. One of them is, why do I believe that the Old Testament is trustworthy? And the next week, why do I believe the New Testament is trustworthy? Because I wanted to base your understanding of at least what I want to say on the trustworthiness of Scripture. Let God be true and every man be a liar. We do not have to act like intellectual sheep and say, well, it's just what I believe. No, no, no. There is 
There is corroboratable historical evidence for Scripture being unique. I am not going to repeat this now. Those DVDs are available. I hope if you have not heard that or seen that, you will get it because I think it will give you confidence and assurance in the trustworthiness of Scripture. And if Scripture is not trustworthy, let's all go home now. So beginning in Roman numeral 7, I want to talk about some of these manuscript problems and some of these things. I, tonight is more informational about the Bible. Uh, hopefully in the, in the next few times I'm going to get into the interpreter and then into the method itself. So this is mostly introductory. But I, I need to do this to lay the foundation for the other th uh, points that are coming. So the major sources of our Bible... I've listed several of them. The, the most important of them is the Masoretic text. When you see MT written, that's what that's referring to. But I want you to know that the Masoretic text was not finished until 900 A.D. The only reason the Masoretic text is the Hebrew text that has survived, it was the text of the Pharisees that survived the destruction of Jerusalem in A.D. 70 and started the rabbinical councils at Jamnia in Palestine. The Sadducees were totally wiped out, the Essenes were totally wiped out, and this is the text of the Pharisees. And what people do is, this is where this code book comes in. and says, oh, you take every, you put it in a computer, you take every 143rd word, and that turns into a prophecy about the West. I could just throw up on prophecy about the West. But do you think that the Masoretic text is the original Hebrew text? If you go, 900 A.D. is when it was finished. Now, it was probably, the text was established in 100 A.D., but not finished till 900 there's an older text than that, and that is the Greek Septuagint. Now, tradition has it. We have archaeologically a letter called the Letter to Aristius that says that Ptolemy II, the king of Egypt, had the largest library in the world at Alexandria, Egypt, and he had many Jewish people in his kingdom. And wanting all, wanted to brag on his library and wanted to placate the Jews, that he got 70 rabbis, and in 70 days they wrote the Septuagint Septuagint. Now, most scholars say that's probably not accurate. But the date for its start, somewhere around 250 to 150 B.C., so here is a Hebrew text that predates the Masoretic text by hundreds of years. You say, well, how do we know that? Because in the Dead Sea Scrolls, beginning to be found in 1947, we have Hebrew manuscripts that follow the Septuagint, and it is not the same as the Masoretic text. Jeremiah is one-third longer in the Septuagint. And we have Hebrew texts that follow the Masoretic text, which means that we do not have the oldest Hebrew text. Now, my view of God is that he preserved for us what we need to know. Amen? M much of what we believe is by faith. We just don't come up with all this evidence, just say we're sure and positive and beyond a shadow of a doubt. But we do believe that we have enough accurate Old Testament, New Testament manuscripts to live a life pleasing to God and certainly to know Him. So we don't know everything. If, there was more, if, if we found several more books about God or Moses, would I allow them in the canon? Absolutely not. We do not need more information. We do not need videotapes in the life of Christ. Everything we need for faith and practice is in Scripture. I'm going to leave it that. I'm going to go to page 16 in the New Testament. Again, I want you to look at these texts. There are 85 papyri texts for the New Testament. There are 286 uncial manuscripts, which is those all caps, no division between the words. As a, as a written language of Koine Greek was developed much, much later, thousand years later, we started having many more handwritten almost. It's called minuscule text. And we have 2,700 of copies of the New Testament in this writing small letter style. On top of that, we have 2,100 copies of lectionaries, which is quotes from Scripture read at different times during the church year. So you add those up, there's 5,300 copies of the New Testament in part or in whole. Now that's far more attestation than any other ancient book. The New Testament has far more evidence by multiples than any other ancient book. But let me ask you a question. Of those 5,300, no two of them exactly agree. Which one's the inerrant one? 
5,300 copies, and none of them exactly agree. So you say, well, what do we do? What do we do? Okay. Quickly, let me go through uh, uh, just a couple of these. I want you to look at number three with me for a minute. This is um, Sinaiticus. This was found by uh, uh, Tischendorf. And the story goes, and you don't know whether to believe this or not, but this is the story. This monastery is on the site down in the Sinai where Moses went up in the mountain, supposedly where Mount Sinai is. This is a walled monastery. You only get in but by lifting up over ropes. And Tischendorf went there, and he, they wouldn't let him look at all the manuscripts, but what he saw was amazing. And they say he went to the potty. And lo and behold, the toilet paper was the oldest ancient Greek New Testament he'd ever seen. He used to say, well, I'm not going to go there. Um, they, he asked them to let him have that thing. They would not. They said, you can be in a room for a week. This man had a photographic memory, and he knew the Greek New Testament well enough that he read this, and after he was out, made a copy of every place it deviated from the text that he knew. Holy moly, what a photographic memory. Some of these other ones were just found in the library of the, of the Vatican, called Vaticanus. One of these comes from Alexandria, Egypt, Alexandrinus. These are the earliest ones we base it on, and they're from the 3rd and 4th centuries. These manuscripts were hand-copied for, for over and over hundreds of years. Now, people say, well, if you go back to the papyri copy, that'll be closest to the New Testament and should have less problems. But the problem is, as these books of Paul and books of John and went through the churches, somebody tried to write them down very quickly. Some of them are very good scribes. They, they record exactly. Other of them are lay people that just want to make a quick, fast copy before the book moves on. And just because it's old doesn't mean it's good. There are some really jerky papyri manuscripts. So just being old is not enough. Now, most of us have been influenced by the King James Version. The King James Version is based on Erasmus' third edition of the, of the New Test, Greek New Testament. The first and second were different, but the third is where King James built on it. Now, I think King James is an excellent word-for-word -word, um, translation. The problem is it's based on the manuscripts that they knew in 1611, and we have far more knowledge, a greater knowledge, of old manuscripts now. And what we found out is that many times, and that's what I, I'd have down here under number 8, the bottom of page 16, you can put these manuscripts in families because they have the same additions and the same errors. And there is an Alexandrian family, a Western family, a Byzantine family, of which 80% of the 5,300 are. And most of that, and, and people say, well, Bob, if, uh, how do you know which one you look? You've got 5,000 copies. Of these 5,000, most of them are from one family. Now, that must be the family that the Holy Spirit wanted to preserve. But, well, that's possible, but it seems logical to me that we ought to go back to the most ancient ones, closer to the original book, than to take the majority, called the majority text, the Textus Receptus, that are basically built on handwritten later manuscripts from the 16th, I mean, 13th, 14th, 15th, 16th century. Seemed like to me the few ancient ones are a better text than a whole bunch of later ones. But you, you've got to decide, and there's a real fight in the church. So on page 17, just to give you an example of some of these problems. In Numbers 25.9, it says that there was a battle and 24,000 died. Paul quotes that in 1 Corinthians 10.8 and says 23,000 died. Oh, the Bible's got errors in it. Holy spit. Do you think there was some little Jew that went around and counted these dead bodies? 12,294, 12,000. These are round numbers, are they not? God acted in history, and a lot of people died. Is the issue where there are 24,000 or 23,000? Does inspiration hang on a number issue? And if it does, don't you ever read Samuel King's and compare it to Chronicles, because you're in big trouble. Because those numbers do not agree, and we're not always sure how to fix it. The other one I want to bring up, and I hope you'll turn with me quickly, to Matthew 27, 9. Matthew 27, 9. Here is a quote that is from the Bibles, and all the Bibles you have and all the translations are going to say, and Jeremiah said, Matthew 27, 9. The problem is, look in the margin of your Bible. 
This is not a quote from Jeremiah. This is a quote from Zechariah. So the question, did a New Testament author mess up the source of a quote? Well, I just want to show you how the church has tried to answer this question. Now, A through H is the church. Listen to these answers. This is a, this is a, this, this, these are tricks, mental tricks, to explain away a perceived error. Just follow this. The Peshitta, the 5th century Syriac, just leaves out the word Jeremiah. Well, that solves it. But you're changing the text. Augustine Luther said an error has occurred in the Masoretic text. Origen and Eusebius said an error occurred in the New Testament text. Jerome, pardon me, Jerome said <laughs> it's a quote from an apocryphal book written by Jeremiah but now lost. Oh man, are we, we're jumping through the weeds now. Listen to this. Mead, commentator from the Middle Ages said, Jeremiah wrote Zechariah 9 through 11. Golly. Now, I think Lightfoot and Schofield probably have the best answer. Jeremiah was considered the first of the prophets in the post-exilic period, and he'd be listed first. So what they're saying is, and this, this makes so much sense to me, in the prophetic section of the canon, it says this. Now, see, that just solves the which, which prophet. I think that's the best one. Hingstenberg says, Zechariah quoted Jeremiah, and John Calvin says, huh, an error crept in the text. Am I going to lose my faith in Jesus Christ over this? You bet your bippy I'm not. This is just not that big a deal. We're talking about hand copied. And besides, we always are thinking Western when the ideal about Jeremiah being the head of the post-exilic period of the prophets fits perfectly of why this got confused. Quite often they say, someone somewhere said. They don't even quote the person who does it. And we're getting all bent out of shape. Well... I've tried next, the next few times to tell you how these errors occurred. And I just challenge you. I know that none of us want manuscript problems. Oh, yuck, none of us want them. But I ask you to get a, a page of any encyclopedia, get a blank piece of paper, you hand copy that page, and you make sure you don't miss anything either. And you let somebody check it. And it will amaze you what happens from our eyes to our hand. You'll skip whole lines. You'll write whole lines again. You'll put another word for the word you just read. It is, it is, it'll amaze you how badly in wanting to, to so much copy it perfectly that you will mess up one encyclopedia page. Just amazing. Sometimes it's a slip of the eye. They drop to another word or drop to a similar word. Sometimes they sit in a room, one monk would read a text and all monks would copy it. So there's a lot of little manuscripts by close-sounding words. I was just thinking one, I forgot what it is. Uh, King James, I think it's in Romans. King James has washed us and the other manuscripts have released us. And the, the word is the word luo and it's pronounced exactly the same for the word washed and the word released. Words that have similar, similar sounds but are spelled differently are often confused. And this is what's happening. Uh, as you know, these texts are divided differently. If you just take a two or three English sentences and put all the words without dividing them up, it will amaze you how you could make sense in different ways out of this series of letters. You could make different words. If you ever play Scrabble, how you make different words out of a series of other words, many times that's what happened in these texts without these people intending to do it. One time it, Paul will say this, and he'll add a little bitty closing thing, but over here he adds a long closing thing, and ancient scribes wanted to make them all the same, so they combined the two. Combined Paul's words. It, it happens over and over. Sometime a... a Somebody will make a note in the margin to explain a text, and the next copier will put the note in the text. I'll show you one of those in just a minute. So look at number two on page 18. Here's what modern textual criticism... Everybody who studies Greek in a university, whether it's a seminary or university, we study the United Bible Society's fourth edition or the Allen edition of New Testament. There is no ancient manuscript like that. That is called an eclectic text where many of these manuscript problems are solved by putting some of these together. And here's how they, how they think about it. The most awkward or unusual text is probably original because scribes tried to fix it. The shortest text is probably original because scribes tended to add and explain.
The older text, with everything else being equal, the older text should be a better text. The text that is most widely geographically diverse probably is the original text because that means a scribe in one place could change it and just some manuscripts have this addition or error where the, all the rest do not. And then finally, every one of these biblical authors have a unique vocabulary, a unique style, and a unique way of expressing themselves. So part of it is, how does this author express himself and is this in line with how he expresses himself? I, I think these are the ways they did. Now, before you think I'm a heretic, and whenever I touch manuscript problems, people start saying, well, I just believe my Bible. I hear that. I understand that. So I'm going to quote Criswell tonight. Now, Criswell, the father of fundamentalism in Baptist life, I want you to hear Criswell, not Utley, say this. He's probably listening. W.A. Criswell told the Greg, uh, Greg Harrison of the Birmingham News that he, Criswell, doesn't believe every word in the Bible is inspired. At least not every word has been given to the modern public by centuries of translators. Criswell said, I'm very much a believer in textual criticism. As such, I think the last half of the 16th chapter of Mark is heresy. It's not inspired, it's just concocted. When you compare those, uh, those manuscripts way back yonder, if you know Crystal, that sounds just like him, <laughs> way back yonder, there's no such thing as a conclusion to the book of Mark. Somebody added it. The patriarch of the SBC in Eratus also claimed that interpolation, this is the adding the margin into the text, um, is also evident in John 5, 4, the account of Jesus at the pool of Bethesda. And he discusses the two different accounts of the suicide of Judas, Matthew 27 and Acts 1. It's just a different view of suicide, Criswell said. If it's in the Bible, there is an explanation for it. The two accounts of the suicide of Judas are in the Bible. Jesus, uh, Criswell added, textual criticism is a wonderful science in itself. It's not uh, ephemeral, it is it's not impertinent, it's dynamic and central. Now, I'm about on page 19 to show you the five or six major manuscript problems. Now, you're going to scream and holler and bite your teeth. If you're interested in this, there is a wonderful little um, commentary from the American Bible Society out by Bruce Metzger, who was in the room when they put all this together, and it's called a textual commentary to the Greek New Testament that explains in English how all this stuff happened. So would you turn with me quick to, to Mark 16.8. Mark 16, 8. As you know, the gospel of Mark, I don't know if you know or not, but if you look at your Bible at verse 8, for some reason the gospel of Mark ends at verse 8, and they went out afraid. What a terrible way to end the gospel. And the early church knew that. And in the manuscript traditions of Mark, there are three different endings, one short, one medium length, and one long. Some manuscripts have one of the three. Some manuscripts have all three. Erasmus, third edition, Greek New Testament, had the longest edition, and that's how it got in King James. I submit to you that everything past verse 8 is uninspired. I submit to you, just along with Criswell, that everything past verse 8 is heretical. There's nowhere else in the Bible that drinking poison and handling snakes is an act of faith. And the groups that believe that tend to get smaller and smaller. Would you turn with me to John, chapter 5, verse 4. Now, my New American Standard, 1970, does not even print verse 4 in the, the text. It puts it in the margin, and that's where it should be. Now, here is Jesus coming to a pool in Jerusalem, and there's sick people all around it. And Jesus asked this one man, why are you here? And he says, uh, whenever I try to get in the water, somebody steps over me. You're going, What? Would you drink from a well with a bunch of sick people around it? What is the deal? There's a Jewish myth, myth, that the well, it's a spring-fed well, so there's bubbles. Whenever there was a bubble or a ripple in the water, it was an evidence that an angel touched the water. And the first person in the water after the bubble was healed. Does that sound like God to you? Does that sound like God? But that explains what that sick man was doing there, and that explains why he told Jesus, I can't get in the water fast enough. So somebody put that explanation, that Jewish myth, that uninspired historical note in the margin, and the next copier put it in the text. 
Now, the one that's going to bother you a lot is John 7, 53. John 7, 53 through 8, 11. Now, the Greek scholar at our school for years and years, and I agree with him when I talked to him about this, he said, you know, Bob, this sounds like something Jesus would do. It certainly does sound like something Jesus would do. I have no doubt Jesus probably did this. This is the uh, healing of the woman caught in adultery where he marks on the ground and let him without sin cast the first stone. Oh, heard, you heard it preached a lot. The problem is, and I hope you'll look at my notes, I've tried to lay it out for you, just lay it out completely. The passage does not appear in any ancient Greek manuscript or early church father quote until the 6th century. In no earlier papyri, no earlier quote from a church father, no earlier lectionary. We know from the manuscript evidence that there is one Luke manuscript where this is tried, the author tried to put it in Luke. In the, in the Johannan manuscripts, this story is put three different places. If you read the text and you skip 53 down to 812, there is no break in the context. Now, this sounds like something Jesus did, and I don't deny he did it, but here's my commitment. I'm committed to apostolic scripture. If an apostle didn't write it, I don't want a sincere early Christian or a later scribe adding to what an inspired apostle wrote. Do you see where I'm coming from? If one of those early guys didn't write it, I don't want just more information from later because I don't believe that's inspired. When I come to this text in my commentary, in my preaching, I just choose not to preach on it. Would you, uh, well, I don't know how many more. You can see the rest of these. May I, would you look at me now? Because I'm running close to my, out of my time. Would you look at me? No major doctrine is affected by manuscript problems. No major doctrine, unless you think drinking poison and handling snakes is a major doctrine. Now, it may not be in the text you think it is. So this is what I say. It's very practical to preachers and Sunday school teachers and the like and Bible students. In the, modern, in, the, in the margin of any modern study Bible is this phrase at certain points, not in the oldest and best manuscripts. My suggestion is, if you're dealing with that text, don't build a doctrine on that verse and find a parallel place where that verse, that doctrine is taught in another verse. Amen? If we're going to teach a truth from God, let's go to an inspired text. Now, I don't think that hurts anything or anybody but we get so dogmatic that the Bible that I have in my lap is exactly what God said. And that's ignorance of the development. You think this thing fell out of of heaven and knocked Martin Luther off a donkey or something? This is a historical development, and it is not very pretty. But we believe by faith that God was involved, and we have everything we need to know for faith and practice. Amen? Well, it's hard to say amen there. I know it is. I know it is. Now, uh... I'm not sure I'm going to get to finish this last little couple of pages, but I want to try. The best theory of translations that I've ever seen is in that book I recommended to you called How to Read the Bible for All It's Worth. And it puts them on a chart from word to word. If there are five Hebrew words, there ought to be five English words. If there are 20 Greek words, there ought to be 20 English words. All the way down to paraphrase. Now, this is a continuum on how do we put one language into another. If you speak two languages, you know how hard it is to completely put in another language what you're thinking and what you've said. Every commentary, every translation is a commentary in some sense. So what we have is how do we best get to this? The modern view is it doesn't matter how many words we have to use. We need to communicate what the ancient writer was talking about. Now that's the dynamic equivalent of NIV. I usually tell preachers who are, do not have time to do Greek and Hebrew as a uh, Uh, something they're familiar with. If you compare a word for word, be it King James, New King James, American Standard, New American Standard, Revised Standard, New Revised Standard, with any dynamic equivalent, uh, today's English version, the uh, the New International Version, um, um, many others like that, where they disagree is where you've got to go to the commentaries because where they disagree is a word problem, a theology problem, a manuscript problem, and you can't get it from an English text. That's where you've got to go to the commentaries. But that'll solve all the problems of where you can't spend your whole time studying every verse every time. So this will really help you find the place. Now the paraphrase really bothers me some. As you know, the Living Bible was written by Kenneth Taylor, who is the president of InterVarsity Press. 
and he wrote his translation for his elementary school children on the train coming home from downtown Chicago. And he would read it to his kids, and if they understand it, he put it in the translation. So those of us who are tacky say that Kenneth Taylor is more conservative than God. Because when God left it ambiguous, Kenneth Taylor knew what he meant and put it in the translation. Now, the Living Bible is a great thing for somebody to read and get the big picture quick. And it can even be used in a sermon or a Sunday school class as a parallel of one good option of what this could mean. But the Living Bible is not a good study Bible. It's not one that a teacher wants to use. I hope you'll think about that. Number C, we've got to remember that the Bible is written in human language. And because it is, we have to speak about God as if he was physical, as if he was temporal, as if he experienced the humanness the way we do. So notice the ways we do this. We've got to know this isn't true. Please tell me. Please tell me. You're not expecting to get to heaven and see an old guy and a young guy on a gold chair and a white bird flying around. Please tell me you don't believe that. God with a human body. God's walks in Genesis. God's eyes. God is a man on a throne. These are all anthropomorphic metaphors. How about God is female? Oh, I'm into it now. Genesis 1, 2, and the Spirit of God over the waters. Brooded. Roosters do great stuff. They don't brood. Hens brood. It's a female bird word. Jesus himself used this. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who killed the prophets, how I would have gathered you as a hen does her chicks, but you would not. El Shaddai. Now, this is probably kind of out there, but the word Shaddai is not a Hebrew word. We don't know what it means. The same trilateral Hebrew root in Arabic means a woman's breast. Ah, don't get crazy. Um, do you know anything more loving, protective, kind, and gentle than a nursing parent, animal, or human? How many times does God describe himself? Isaiah 66, Though a nursing mother may neglect her child, I will never neglect you, O Israel. God comparing him. And I really think that Hosea 11, as I showed you in that sermon I did, is talking about a loving father and a nursing mother. Um, how I bore, Deuteronomy 32, 18, how I bore you on eagle's wings. Only female eagles teach the baby to fly. Male eagles have to go stand on flagpoles. Female eagles push the babies out of the nest, soar them back on their pinions. That's a female metaphor for God. How about... Um, well, they're all there. And then if you really get too tough, have you seen that God is a liar in 1 Kings 22? That God puts a lying spirit in the mouth of the prophets? My friends, I hope you know that's a vision. And I hope you know that's not the character of God. And I hope you know that the evil one is there and God allows him to put the lie in the mouth of the prophets. I hope you look at that. But it's still an anthropomorphic metaphor. How about God's right hand? I heard the story, I think I told you, about the Sunday school teacher that taught on this and the student went home to mother and said mother 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 god can't move and mother said why said jesus is sitting on his right hand you get you get literal you get crazy in some of this how about god described um in other metaphors shepherd father kinsman redeemer young faithful lover parent father mother how about god described in physical objects a rock a fortress, a shield, the horn of your salvation, a tree, Hosea 14.8. Now watch these last two points and I'm through. Somebody said, you're going to give an invitation? Yeah, we're going to decide to go home. <laughs> Number two, language is part of the image of God, Genesis 1, 26 and 27. Part of the image is our ability to communicate with each other and with him. God is personal. He's allowed our minds to have this ability to communicate orally. But sins affected all aspects of our existence, including our language. God is faithful and communicates to us adequately, if not exhaustively, knowledge about himself. This is usually in the form of negation, God is not a man that he should lie, analogy, father, mother, or metaphor, tree, shield, never flo ever-flowing stream. These are metaphors. 
We're meant to understand a characteristic from them, but not to lock God into some kind of physicalness. Remember the great prayer of Solomon when he built the temple? The, the universe cannot contain you, O oh God, much less this little house that I've built for you. God does not have a body. God is not male or female. God is an eternal spirit present throughout the creation. He manifests to us, human. He puts information on the lowest shelf. I submit to you, heaven does not have streets of gold. Heaven is not a cube, a hundred, a, a thousand, uh, five hundred strata squared. Heaven's far better than gold, far bigger than that. Why do we get locked up in these metaphors and, and cease to realize they're an aspect of the character of God forced into the physical humanness of our world's language, caught up in atoms and temporal existence, and God is far beyond that. Well, I hope you'll think about these things. Uh, next time, I'm going to deal with the interpreter, and it's just one page, so we'll get, we'll get through it easily, and maybe I'll have a chance to let you ask questions on, on that session. Maybe we pray just a moment. Lord, I just love your book. I've committed my whole life to studying it and trying to understand it. But to deny that it has problems is just to put our head in the sand. There are manuscript problems. There are number problems. There are metaphors and analogies. We feel like we know you. We feel like we can trust you. We feel like that you're with us and for us and will never let us go. And the hairs of our head are numbered. Thank you for these metaphors. Thank you for language that goes beyond the, the crude literal that help, help us catch a glimpse of your majesty and glory far beyond the creation of this little bitty planet, the third from this little bitty sun. God, God of, of a universe so big we can't see the end. Forgive us for limiting you to the physical shape of a human being. And yet you've come to us as a loving person, a redeemer, a savior, a defender. We thank you for these truths. We thank you for this love. And we know that you would not trick us, but we know because of our fall, because of our limited ability, because our mind is, cannot put out all that you created it to be, that in this time we see through a glass darkly, but one day we will fully know you and fully know reality. But until then, we can trust your revelation to, com to adequately communicate to us your characters, your truth, and your invitation to come. I thank you for these. I know this, in many ways this is new information, and it goes against much that we have been taught by loving people in our churches. I pray, Lord, you would help us to think through these issues that in our day, our postmodern day, our anti-Christian day, that we could not only live the Christian life, but know why we live the Christian life and be ready to give a defense for anyone who asks for the hope that is in us. In Jesus' name, amen. Shalom, y'all.